Congratulations, you have just found the number one over 50 health and wellness podcast on the planet. Hello and welcome to the Over 50 Health and Wellness Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin English. I'm the founder of The Silver Edge and our mission is to help you build and maintain a lean, healthy body that you love for the rest of your life so that you can show up in the second half of your life as the healthiest, strongest, most vital version of yourself. Today, we have another episode of the Coach's Corner. So there's no guest, it's just me. And we'll be back next week with our normal interview format. So this week, I want to give you a quick update on what's happening over here at the Silver Edge. And then I'm going to talk about your lifespan versus your health span and give you a few tips for increasing both of those. After that, I talk about the importance of sleep for healthy aging because you guys know I love sleep for healthy aging over here. Now, before we dig into today's episode, we're going to mention metabolism here in a few minutes because, I mean, that's kind of my jam and you're not going to get a podcast episode without me bringing up the importance of optimizing your metabolism at least once per episode. But if you haven't already done so, I want you to head over to silveredgefree.com and grab your free copy of the Over 50 Guide to Optimizing Your Metabolism. This guide gives you actionable tips that you can do today to catapult you towards your goal of building and maintaining a lean, healthy body that you love for the rest of your life. I'll drop a note to the link for that in the show notes, but unless you're driving a car or maybe listening to this podcast while performing open heart surgery, if I was you, I'd pause this episode right now, go download that guide, and then meet me back here. Again, you can find that guide over at silveredgefree.com. Okay, enough of that. Let's get on with today's show. So last week I mentioned I wanted to do a new segment on these coaches' corners, and I wanted you guys to email me your questions, and I'll pick a question each week and read it out on the podcast. Now, I got to say, I asked last week, Friday for you folks to email me your questions. And I got a pretty, if I'm being honest, a lackluster response. So here goes. I'm asking again, folks, please email me your questions. I would love to, A, I'd love to read your question and give my answer on air, but I'm selfishly also interested in what do you guys want to hear? What do you want to know? So again, the way to do this is just email me at coach at silveredgefitness.com. Send me your question. And then if you don't mind, just put in there whether it's okay for me to use your full name or if you prefer me just to use your first name. All right. So our first question of the week was submitted by Diane. And I picked this one because it comes up all the time. And it's this. Diane says, what are your recommendations for stay? Let's see, what does she say here? What are your recommendations for staying on track with my nutrition while I'm on vacation? I'm traveling to Colorado for two weeks and I don't want to gain 10 pounds and undo all of my hard work. Thanks in advance. Okay, Diane, first things first, you're not going to gain 10 pounds in two weeks unless you truly go hog wild. So, but I think I get the gist of what you're saying. Basically, you want to go on vacation. You want to enjoy yourself. You sounds like you're working hard at maintaining a lean, healthy body. Maybe you're in, I'm not sure where you are on your health and fitness journey, but it sounds like you're either trying to maintain or maybe uh, trying to lose some weight. So first things first, don't worry about gaining 10 pounds in two weeks. That would be a drastic amount of weight gain. And you would really have to go off the rails in order to do that. But here's, here's the advice that I tell you, and I tell the same thing to my clients all the time. First things first is this. A vacation is, by definition, a break from your normal routine. It's basically a time for you to relax and to let loose, have fun, and to really connect deeply with your family or loved ones or whoever you're traveling with. It's a time for you to really experience a new place and a new situation, a new environment. And that should be the main focus of your vacation as opposed to what you are or aren't going to eat. Now, you mentioned that you don't want to undo all your hard work. And I just want to be careful here that you have a healthy relationship with food and that you're not overly restricting. Again, I'm not sure where you are in your journey, 
But here are my top tips for just kind of not going off the rails, if you will, while you're on vacation. And number one is this, have one or two non-negotiables. So what do I mean by that? So for me, for example, when I go on vacation, one of my non-negotiables is I will eat 200 grams of protein every day. Come hell or high water, that's going to happen. It's a non-negotiable. Another one might be I am going to get a minimum of 100 ounces of water every day. So there you go. Two non-negotiables for me. Everything else is just kind of, I'm going to play it by ear, but no matter what, those two things are going to happen. So I bring up those two because those are two pretty solid ones. Now, you don't have to make those your non-negotiables. Figure out what your non-negotiables are. But I love the idea of making sure that you are prioritizing your protein. In other words, make sure you eat your protein first. Get plenty of protein. And then if you want dessert, have dessert. If you want some, some fancy, gooey, starchy, wonderful goodness, enjoy some. You're on vacation. That's what this is about. But make sure you get that whatever your minimum of protein is, make sure you're hitting that target every day. Number two is to get your steps in. So this is easy for most of us, depending on your on your vacation. Most of us go places and we can hike, we can get out and sightsee. That's kind of the point of doing a vacation, right? So make sure you're getting your steps. If you're somebody who has a fairly sedentary life, you're probably going to get more steps anyway. But if you're somebody who normally gets, say, 10,000 steps a day, A, good for you. But B, make sure that you're maintaining close to that or maybe even more than that while you're on vacation. Number three, and I've already mentioned this as well, is stay hydrated. Even if it's not one of your non-negotiables saying, hey, I'm going to get half my body weight in ounces of water, which is, by the way, a great target. But just stay hydrated. Drink water. And that leads me to my last tip, and it's this. It's moderation. It's moderation specifically with alcohol. If you're a drinker, my personal recommendation is to have an alcohol game plan. This one in particular seems to get a lot of us, not a popular opinion here, but when you go on vacation, it's not an excuse just to have tons and tons of drinking. And there's a couple of reasons for this. In addition to the additional calories, because let's face it, alcohol is calories, right? But really what's happening when we're consuming more alcohol than usual, or really any alcohol, is we're disrupting our metabolism. We're disrupting our sleep. Let's put it this way. The healthy number of drinks is zero. Now, that being said, there could be some social benefit to relaxing with a loved one and connecting deeply with a partner over a glass of wine. Now, that's way different than getting blackout drunk while you're on a cruise or something along those lines. So I would recommend having a game plan. Know in advance, and maybe this is one of your non-negotiables. I won't have more than two drinks on any given day, or I won't have more than one drink on the weekdays, something like that, but some sort of a plan so that you don't go into your vacation and just that's the thing that throws you way off. The Again, the drinking, it's, it's not serving you in any way biologically or physiologically. It is disrupting your sleep. It's slowing your metabolism. The other thing that happens when we tend to overconsume is we make poor choices. Specifically, we make poor food choices many times. If you think about it, if you've ever been out, had a few drinks, you're not craving a kale salad. You just aren't. You're craving the gooey nachos with extra cheese on them. So again, have some sort of a game plan for your uh, drinking if you're a drinker. So thanks, Diane. And folks, please remember, send your questions to coach at silveredgefitness.com. I'd love to answer them here on the air. Okay, let's do a couple social shout outs. So my shout out today, my fitness shout out is a guy named Joe Yoon, and he's wildly popular on Instagram. You can find him at Joe Therapy, J-O-E-T-H-E-R-A-P-Y, Joe Therapy. He's got over a million followers. I think he's got like 1.3 million followers, but this guy's a mobility guru, Tons of great information, tons of um, really practical examples of stretches, mobility drills, things like that. And while I, he's certainly not an over 50 guy himself, all of the material and content that he puts out is very, very relevant to us. So if that's not, if you're not one of the 1.3 million people already following Joe Therapy, I'd recommend you check him out. He's got great content. 
for my personal social shout out this this week, I've got a fun one for you. I absolutely love this one. This is high art, people. Just bear with me. It's a guy named Brian Monarch. I know nothing about him. His Instagram handle is at Brian Monarch, M-O-N-A-R-C-H. But he does these, I don't know what you call it. Is it is it deep fake? Is that the is that the right word? But Basically, he is taking these famous, iconic movie scenes and he's putting Arnold Schwarzenegger or somebody else's face, but it's very commonly Arnold Schwarzenegger's face on other people's. You have to see it. To, I'm doing a horrible job describing this, but it's very, very clever. It's basically Arnold's face in, say, Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz, right? She, and then when she's singing somewhere over the... It's Arnold's voice actually singing it. It's hilarious. This guy's brilliant. Like I said, really high art here. You guys check it out. I think you'll enjoy it. I'll throw the link to both of those in the show notes. Anything we talk about today, you can find those in the show notes. And that'll be at silveredgefitness.com slash 195. <laughs> How to increase your health span. Have you ever wondered why some folks are rocking the tennis court in their mid-90s while others are frail and feeble and require assisted care? Lifespan is about how many years you live and modern medicine is doing a great job of increasing this. But health span, on the other hand, is how many years you live healthy and strong and vital and capable. So in other words, Lifespan, how many years chronologically you're going to live. Your health span is how many years you're going to live healthy. So I want to talk about some ways that we can increase our health span. And look, by increasing our health span, we are absolutely going to increase our lifespan. Let's talk about a few ways. And the first one is metabolism. You know, I told you at the top of the show, you're not going to get away without me talking about metabolisms. And one of the best ways to increase your health span is to optimize your metabolism. And when I say optimize your metabolism, I'm really talking about speeding it up. So for most of you, most of us, we have that sluggish, slow metabolism. What are some things we can do to really rev it up? We, we can think of a metabolism as a fire, and you don't want your metabolism to be just a slow, small, glowing ember. You want it to be a roaring furnace of a fire. So that's the, one of the first things we can do to really increase our health span. Now, you might say, well, okay, that's all fine and good, but how do I increase my metabolism? Well, the next three or four things we're going to talk about directly impact optimizing and speeding up your metabolism. So next on my list is, of course, nutrition. And it's probably no surprise. We eat a bunch of junk food. You're not going to live as long or a healthy of a life, right? Now, I want to start out by talking about nutrition by stating that nutritional science is a vastly complex subject. And our modern media coverage only throws gas on that fire, really. So it seems like there's a new new study shows type headline every single day. And oftentimes it's quite contradictory. How are we supposed to make sense of this, especially for those of us that maybe don't have PhDs in nutritional science? How do we keep up with all the conflicting information we see regarding nutrition? I'll, I'll just say this. Look, nutritional science is, in fact, vastly complex. However, eating healthy is not. And it's simply this. Let's just start here. Let's eat whole foods. Get rid of the highly processed, hyper palatable packaged crap. Yeah, it tastes good. Yeah, it's convenient. And sadly enough, it's cheap. But we are trading our health for that convenience, for that taste, for that low cost. So number one, we're going to eat whole foods. Number two, we're going to eat the right amount of foods. Now, for most of you are probably thinking, yeah, I need to eat a little bit less to get rid of these pounds around the middle here. And you might be right. But when I say we should eat the right amount of food, this also includes eating enough. So I'm talking specifically to those of you that are yo-yo dieters and chronic dieters. Some of you folks that are overweight but have been chronically under eating all your life. Now, you may be thinking, well, whoa, 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 hang on, Kev. Did you just say chronically under eating but overweight? 
yes, I did. And that goes back to our metabolism. What happens is, is those of us that get into this unhealthy state where we're overweight, we realize we're overweight, so we start dieting. The diet works and works until it doesn't, and then we stop, and then we we gain those pounds back. I think most of you listening to this know what I'm talking about, right? So you go on a different diet. You lose a few pounds. You gain that weight back. Maybe this time the weight comes back and it brings along some of its buddies. So now you're actually you're heavier than you were before you started the diet. So you start another diet and you start another diet. Now you're starting to do some cardio on top of all of that. And all of a sudden what happens is, is your metabolism is perceiving this continuous dieting or this yo-yo dieting, it's seeing it as periods of famine or of food scarcity. And it's slowing your metabolism, which is just a fancy way of saying your calorie burn way down. So now you're burning way fewer calories at rest because you have this, you don't have a broken metabolism. Your metabolism is doing exactly what it's evolutionarily designed to do, which is keep you alive. But you've got this metabolism in this really, you're back to that little slow glowing tiny ember instead of that roaring fire. We want to throw some logs on there and get that fire burning. And guess how we do that? We do that by eating more. Okay. Bear with me. So <laughs> I may have lost some of you there. You're like, wait a minute. So I'm overweight, but I'm under eating. And now you're saying eating more and I'll lose weight. Kind of, it doesn't, it's, it's not quite that simple, but basically when we look at eating the right amount of food, if we think about periodizing how we eat, if we take a, let's just say um, we're going to take the next six months and we're going to map out a plan, we might spend a month or six weeks where our primary focus is not fat loss. It's building our metabolism. So that would be things like, I'm going to focus on strength training. I'm going to focus on eating a little bit more foods. I'm going to focus on getting more protein. I'm going to focus on eating the right foods. And I'm not going to worry about fat loss. I'm just going to bump up my calories a tiny bit over time. And then when I get to a healthy place, now I'm moving better, I'm stronger, I'm sleeping better, my mood's improved, I feel good. I mean, we're, I'm, I'm, eating a, I'm eating a healthy amount of food. Of course I feel better. Now I'll go on a diet. Now I'll go into a calorie deficit, but I won't mess around. I won't stay there long. Let's say four, six weeks. I'll just drop a few pounds and then I'll take that slow metabolic restoration path again. I'll start eating a little bit more food. My focus will go, will move from fat loss to muscle building. I'll try and get stronger. I'll try and be more capable. I'll work on developing some functional movement and mobility and feeling better. I'll do that for a period and then when I feel good, when I'm getting strong and I'm eating plenty of food, I'll go on a diet. I won't mess around. I'll spend four, six weeks. I'll lose a few pounds and I'll, re I'll repeat that. Here's the deal. You will not lose weight as fast as if you just go on a crash diet doing the method I just described. Hands down, you're right. It will take longer. We're releasing this here in May. It's beginning of summer. Some of you are thinking, well, I, I want to be bikini ready for bikini season, which is next month. Well, unless you're really close to being within striking range of having whatever your ideal beach body is, you're probably not going to get there in a month anyway, right? You're probably just going to do a whole bunch of metabolic damage to yourself trying to get there. Rather, if we take that long, slow, patient approach, what happens is we have this very healthy road to weight loss that is sustainable, that lasts for the rest of our life. So when I say eat the right amount of foods, I'm not necessarily eating less food. I'm, you, if those of you that have listened to this podcast for a while know I'm not a big proponent of the very generic and well-meaning ad medical advice of eat less and move more. There's a time and a place to eat less, and, and certainly we should all, many of us should be moving more. But at any rate, if you want more information on that in particular, download that uh, uh, metabolism guide that I talked about in the intro. I'll also mention it in the outro. You can find it in the show notes, but that goes into more detail. All right, I think I got way off track here. We were talking about how to increase your health span. We said, hey, let's get that metabolism roaring. I just gave you some tips there. We talked about nutrition. Look, eat whole foods. If you do nothing else, just getting rid of the processed food and drink, eating real whole foods, prioritizing healthy protein, that is 80, if not 90% of the battle right there. Eat the right amount of foods and know that even if you're overweight, that might not mean eating less. And then 
drink in moderation. We had talked a little bit about, who was it? It was Diane that wrote in the question about on vacation. One of my pieces of advice there is drink in moderation. If we're talking about your health span, certainly excessive alcohol doesn't really play a very healthy role when it comes to increasing either your lifespan or or your health span. So I, I'm a big, big advocate of having some sort of a moderation strategy, if not an abstinence strategy. In fact, I'll go ahead and put in a plug for a, a podcast episode I did. I, I really should prepare better for these things. Her name was, I think it was Carolina, Carol, Carolina, Carolina, um, with an unpronounceable last name. I'm not even going to try it right now, but it was, um, and I'll put a link to this if you're, if you're interested in the show notes, but it was a podcast on being sober curious. So she is, and she personally herself does not drink and she advocates for not She's not a teetotaler and said, you shouldn't drink because it's bad for you. Nothing like that. In fact, quite, quite the opposite. She said, hey, you should, in fact, be sober curious. You should dig into why you're drinking. You should experiment with sobriety and see what happens. If you're all interested in that episode, check it out. It was, a, it was eye-opening for me and really made me rethink about my own current relationship with alcohol, which is always evolving. All right. Again, I'm afraid I went down a rat hole, but we're back. Um, all right. We're increasing our health span, right? So we are going to fire up that metabolism. We're going to eat some healthy foods. Next up is we're going to exercise. So when I say exercise, or let's just call this section movement, general movement, but within that bucket of general movement, we have a couple of different things, right? We could do cardio. We could go for walks. We could do strength training. Here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say we're going to prioritize strength training. So first things first, we're going to all try and get a little bit stronger because that 100%, especially those of us over 50, 100% will move the needle on improving our quality of life or our health span. Now, ladies, I'm especially talking to you. I say, yes, make friends with the barbell. Some of you that have been doing aerobics for years and years, or you love the treadmill and you do the stair stepper, you like the cardio classes, you like the, um, you like the circuit training, you like the hit type stuff. Nothing wrong with any of that, but know that prioritizing strength, taking some time, and I'm not talking about anything crazy, living in the gym. I'm talking about three days a week, maybe 45 minutes to an hour of full body resistance training, basically lifting weights. Find a well thought out periodized weight training regimen and stick to it. And my advice would actually be to go easy on the cardio. Now, for those of you endurance athletes out there, you over 50 maniacs that are doing marathons and triathlons and just, or you orange theory folks, you CrossFitters that just can't live without that really intense um, conditioning stuff. Have at it. Go for it. However, know that you are not, in fact, increasing either your longevity or your health span with that type of training, especially if that's exclusively the type of training you're doing. Now, if that's what you love to do and that's your passion, have at it. But in terms of really having a quality health span, you want to make friends with the barbell. You want to have some sort of strength training regimen. You want to go a bit easier on the cardio, but you want to have some sort of a general restorative movement practice daily. And the easiest way for most of us is to walk. So the gold standard there, everybody's heard it a million times, walk 10,000 steps a day. And you see in popular media, well, that doesn't really apply. That's not appropriate for people over 50. Look, just have a walking practice, get up and move. And if you move, if you walk 10,000 steps a day, fantastic. If you walk 5,000 steps a day, that's great. Maybe you make it a goal to start walking 6,000 steps a day and just start easing up on that. But exercise, absolutely movement we know is going to increase our health span significantly. All right, next up on how to increase our health span is sleep. I'm getting ready to discuss sleep here in just a minute, but just know that Getting eight hours of quality sleep consistently is the foundation for over 50 health and is one of the big levers that you have in terms of determining whether you're going to have a long, wonderful health span or not so much. All right, moving on, kind of related to sleep, manage stress. So our stress response evolved to keep us alive. But here's the deal. What kept us alive a thousand or 10,000 years ago doesn't really serve us very well today. 
our body doesn't know the difference between us being chased by a big, scary cave bear or us being stuck in traffic or us being pissed off at our spouses or us being slammed at work. So know that all stress is additive in your body. And this includes good stress. Good stress could be things like doing a cold plunge, which is all the rage right now, working out, um, doing a sauna, uh, going on a diet, being in a calorie deficit. All these things are stresses, but so is your life stress, the stress at work, the stress in traffic, your relationship stress, your stress with your kids, your stress with whatever it is. All of this adds up. And if you don't have the ability to, let's say, recover more than your body stacks up these stresses, you're in for a tough time when it comes to having a long, meaningful health span. When we talk about stress, sometimes we don't really have control over our stressors. If you live in a stressful situation, maybe you have an elderly parent living with you and you're a caregiver. Um, that's, that's just a, that's just a, that's a fact, right? You can't really change that easily, or maybe you're in a high stress job, but it's a, it's, that's your career and you've only got a few more years to retirement and you're not going to do anything drastic that it just is what it is. But what we can do is come up with some stress managed practices. In other words, we can work on how we, how we respond to those stressors. Now, here are a couple of my favorite ways of managing stress. Number one is I personally have a gratitude practice. I have a prayer practice and I have a meditation practice. And these sometimes are one thing, to be perfectly honest. And other times they're different things. I have a separate meditation time from a prayer time from a gratitude time. But think of things like journaling. Think of things like um, meditating. Think of things like having a gratitude practice. Here's a, here's one that I really love. Start out every morning, first thing, by journaling three things you're grateful for. So that's got to be really easy the first day. You say, okay, I'm grateful for my spouse. I'm grateful for my health. I'm grateful for my children, whatever. Just three things, right? And then on day two, you're going to journal three more things. You're going to write down three things that you're grateful for. Again, that should be very, very easy. Hopefully you have six things in your life that you're grateful for. Day three rolls around. Write down three more things that you're grateful for. Now you're probably scratching your head. Let's see, what else am I grateful for? And these can be tiny things. They can be little things. They can be insignificant things, but they're things that you're genuinely grateful for. So you get day four, you get day five, you get day six. Along comes week two. And now what happens is you're really thinking, you're looking back through your notes and say, oh no, I already wrote that down. What else am I grateful for? And what this practice does, it causes you to actually reflect on what you're grateful for. And the other thing that I found personally when doing this exercise is when I go through my day, I'm intentionally looking for things to be grateful for. So as I'm going out doing my things during the day and I, you know, I smell some lovely food coming from a restaurant, I think, Ooh, I got to remember that because I can write that down tomorrow from what I'm grateful for. I'm grateful for being here in this moment and smelling that delicious aroma of cooking food or whatever, right? You're taking a walk in the woods and you see a beautiful bird fly by. Oh, I got to remember to write that down. But it gives you a reason to be intentional about gratitude. And a lot of times this can help manage stress. I'll leave you with this other stress uh, stress management practice, and that's breathing. Specifically, some deep, slow breaths. And there's a ton of different methodologies, and we can get into some really fancy stuff here. But we'll keep it simple. If you just take a long, deep breath deep into your belly, just four or five seconds of hold it for a moment. in that long, slow exhale. And the magic is really in that long, slow exhale. Your body is physiologically hardwired to perceive that as a de-stressing signal. It's It's a signal that tells your body I'm safe. Because let's face it, when you're in a panicked situation, think about what you're doing. You're doing the opposite of that. You're probably mouth breathing. You're probably have an elevated heart rate. You're respiration rate is quick. But when you take that deliberate, slow inhale, hold for a moment, that slow, long exhale, you're telling your body, you're sending a signal that you're safe. You're moving yourself from that fight or flight state into that rest and digest state. So as you find yourself getting wound up during the day, 
take a moment and practice just that breathing. And I said I was going to leave you with one last thing, but (laughs) I got one more thing for you. If you remember back, I don't know, half a dozen podcast episodes or so, we talked to Jake, somebody or other. Again, I really should research these better before I press record on this thing. But we talked to Jake and we talked to him about the power of awe. And I'm saying awe, A-W-E. Um, I hopefully I remember, but I will put that into the show notes as well. The link to that episode, but he has just this, this very short duration, intentional pause to get centered and to really help manage stress. So check that out if you haven't already. Okay. Sorry, folks. I didn't mean to go so long on this. Let's, let's move along here. The next two things I'm going to talk about in terms of increasing your health span, our community and purpose. And I just want to give you a heads up. I just did an interview this week with a guy named John Briggs. He is a, he's been a, a guy, I guess he's been in the corporate world doing these um, coordinating retreats for high performing teams of corp, both like professional sports teams, but I think just as many corporate teams as well. So he's been in that high performance type space for quite some time. And he's got this covered bridge program now where he's talking about life transitions. And we're going to talk all about that on next Wednesday's podcast. So that's going to drop just a few days from today. So if you're interested in community and purpose, definitely check that out because we dive deep into these two topics. All right. So community, what does community have to do with health span? One of the number one indicators of longevity, which again is admittedly that's your lifespan, is a strong social network and a sense of community. So we know for a fact that people over 50 and even more so people over 60, that depression, loneliness, and even suicide are all on the rise in this population. And one of the biggest reasons for that, there's a number of reasons. And again, if this if this lands with you at all, make sure you check out that interview coming up next Wednesday. But one of the biggest reasons is that we just don't have that community. Specifically, after we retire, if you think about it, your identity is da- probably wrapped up in your career for a lot of us. Or many of us have been, we're moms, or we identify as mom, and our, all of a sudden our kids are, are grown and they're out of the house and they have families of their own. Now that you're still a mom, of course, but your roles have shifted. So we go through these these life changes after 50, after 60, after 70. And if we don't have a strong community to really support us and to be there for us that we can lean on and that we can lean into, it really has a negative impact on our health span. And the last one is purpose. And when I say purpose, I mean knowing your why. I mean believing in something greater than yourself. I mean serving a higher purpose or maybe put another way, serving other people, serving things other than yourself. And I know this is a big one because I personally am on a journey to to really step into my purpose. I spent the largest part of my adult life not really knowing why I'm here, what I'm supposed to do. And I felt a little directionless and aimless. And it wasn't until I really recently stepped into this new role of of being an entrepreneur, of being a health and wellness coach and serving this community and having a mission in this community that I really felt all of a sudden that all of the pieces clicked into place. I I know my purpose. I know why I'm here. And every day I'm just so blessed and so excited to get to do this and fostering some sort of purpose. If you don't have a sense of purpose, fostering that, digging into that, finding out what lights your fire and more importantly, sharing that fire with others. Spread that fire all over the world. Make a wildfire out of your passion, right? So knowing your purpose, leaning into your purpose, really important for especially those of us over 50 when we talk about how are we going to spend this third act of our life? We know that our medical system is keeping us alive longer and longer. But I don't know about you. I'd much rather be that 90 year old out there swinging wildly on the pickleball court, let's say, than being feeble and frail, sick and in need of care. So I'll just wrap up by saying, look, again, technology, modern medicine, doing a great job of increasing our lifespan, but focusing on your holistic health today will ensure a long health span tomorrow. 
Lack of sleep is killing your weight and fitness goals. Okay, so last weekend, my wife and I had a we had a crazy weekend night. Now, I, I should back up and I should tell you, I have, I love my sleep. I protect my sleep. I guard it ferociously. I have consistent bedtimes and wake times. But real life is real life. And so, no, I don't always go to bed at the same time and wake up at the same time, although I really want to. So last weekend, uh, my wife and I went out. A friend of ours had just graduated. She went back to school later in life, got a degree. And so she had this big celebration. We also had a birthday uh, dinner for another couple. So we went to this big, fancy three-hour dinner. So I was already out past my bedtime right there. But then we went to this celebration. We're celebrating a friend who just graduated. So needless to say, I was out way past my bedtime. Now, I'm currently experimenting with sobriety, so I'm not drinking at all. Didn't drink a drop, and everybody loves a good designated driver, so that was my role. My job was to, to ferry my wife home safely. I did. But I went to bed really, really late. And unfortunately, I'm just not a guy who can sleep in. So I woke up at my usual time. Also, I got a bunch of chickens, and the rooster starts crowing like crazy about 5.45, 6 o'clock in the morning if we don't let him out. So... I only got a few hours of sleep that night and here's what happened. I woke up and all day long, I was off my game. My workout was subpar. I had a, just a low grade headache. I was actually for whatever odd reason, I just felt vaguely nauseous. I honest to God felt like I had a small hangover. I just felt like crap. And that just goes to show you how powerful sleep is. When I get my eight hours of beauty sleep, I feel superhuman. When I get three or four hours of sleep, I feel like crap. And look, I don't want to be a wallflower. I want to be able to <laughs> operate in the real world where sometimes, yes, I stay up past midnight. But I also want to bring home the importance of having a sleep routine and getting healthy sleep. So many of us aren't getting sufficient sleep. I think the, I read a statistic that, um, what was it? 30% of us adults aren't even getting the minimum required amount of sleep, let alone optimal sleep. And, op and by optimal sleep, I mean the gold standard of eight hours a night. So quality sleep helps us lose fat. It helps us gain muscle. Uh, we regulate our blood sugar. We regulate our hunger and appetite signals. And the exact opposite happens when we don't get enough sleep. So that being said, I just want to quickly go through some of my top sleep tips to ensure healthy sleep. Number one, healthy sleep starts actually when you wake up. So my first tip is to get morning sun exposure. So ideally you get outside and go for a walk. But even if you just sat and had your coffee in a sunny window, what happens when we get that morning sun is biologically what's going on there is we have this relationship between cortisol and melatonin. There should be this healthy inverse relationship to them, right? You probably know you want your, your melatonin to rise as you're going to bed. So you feel sleepy and your cortisol to be falling off and you want the exact opposite to happen in the morning. We want that cortis that cortisol to rise up and that melatonin to fall off that natural circadian rhythm. Well, Morning sun or sunlight or light exposure is really what triggers that. So getting morning sun exposure is one of the first things we can do in the day to ensure we have a healthy night's sleep that night. Now, that's not obvious to a lot of people, right? When we think about healthy sleep, we're probably thinking about having a little chamomile tea or something before bed. But absolutely getting outside, get a little of that sun exposure, wonderful for a healthy night's sleep. Number two is sleep consistency. And by sleep consistency, I mean regular bed and wake time. So going to bed at the same time every night, roughly, and waking up at the same time. Now, most of us do a good job of this on the weekdays, and we do a crappy job of this on the weekends. In other words, we have one set of bedtime and wake times on the on the weekdays. And then we just throw that out the window and do something completely different on the weekends. We stay up way later. Maybe we Maybe we sleep in or in my case, don't sleep in and just get a, a much less sleep. But what happens there? Think about this. If you travel across the country, you're going to get a little bit of jet lag. You're basically giving yourself jet lag weekly if you have a different bed and wake time schedule on the weekdays and weekends. So start to bring those bed and wake times together. If you normally go to bed at 10 o'clock on the 
on the weekdays, but you stay up till midnight or one on the weekends, try and bring those weekend nights a little earlier, a little closer to that 10 o'clock time and get that more consistent um, sleep and wake time. Number three, turn off electronics one hour before bed. Now, this one doesn't win me any friends. <laughs> this, this one seems to be a tough one for a lot of folks. But there's a couple of reasons for this. The number one is, of course, you probably see this coming, the blue light, right? We're blue light from all of our electronics. And what that, that goes back to the melatonin and the cortisol. That blue light is actually inhibiting our melatonin production. So it is not allowing that melatonin to come on nice and strong and make us feel sleepy. But the other reason why you don't want those electronics an hour before bed is because of the stimulation. Most of us, when we have an electronic, we're probably not watching a lullaby. We're probably watching some a stimulating TV show or worse yet, we're reading the news or or flipping through social media posts and getting triggered. So that does the opposite again of what we want. That's raising cortisol. That's We want cortisol down, melatonin up as we're going to sleep. So turn off electronics at least an hour before bed. If you absolutely can't do that, yes, you can use good quality blue light blocking glasses. They do help. That will help some with the, of course, with the blue light. It does nothing to help with the stimulation part that I was just referring to. All right, tip number four, keep your bedroom cool and dark. And by dark, I mean blackout dark. Consider investing in some blackout curtains if you don't already have a, a dark place to sleep. And even nerd out a little bit. If you have, um, an, a, say, an alarm clock, a digital alarm clock, swap that out for something that doesn't have a glowing face. If you have a little electronic light LED light somewhere, put a piece of tape over it. Really get that room dark and get it cool. Studies show us that the optimal temperature for human sleep is 65 degrees, and that's a lot colder than most people are sleeping in. So a cool, dark place, ideal for healthy sleep. Here's one of my favorite. It's have a pre-bed ritual. In other words, do the same thing right before you go to sleep every night. And basically, this helps condition you to go to sleep. I personally have a gratitude prayer that I do right before I fall asleep every single night. And by right before I fall asleep, I mean right before I fall asleep. So I'm, I'm not doing this 30 minutes before bed or 15 minutes before bed. I'm doing this as I'm laying in bed. I have my head on the pillows. My eyes are closed. And the last thing I do before I fall asleep is I give thanks. I no matter how crappy my day was, no matter how horrible, there's something I can give thanks for. And it's just kind of my way of, A, preparing myself for sleep, but I like to bookend my days. I, I wake up with gratitude. I go to sleep with gratitude. And it just kind of helps set the helps set the tone both for healthy sleep and for the day to come. Next one, and this is an obvious one, but avoid caffeine afternoon. I see a bunch of you out there chugging down the coffees or worse yet, the energy drinks that to try and stave off that dreaded two or three o'clock slump. And look, if you're somebody who's suffering from two or three o'clock PM slumps, hit me up. We should talk. That's not normal. It's common. <laughs> it's not normal. But having caffeine to get you through that is absolutely not helping your sleep. The half-life of caffeine is much longer than the time you're you're drinking it till the time you go to bed. So that caffeine is still active in your body 100% while you're trying to fall asleep. And my last one, again, not going to win me any friends here, but avoid alcohol. I'm not advocating day drinking. I think you probably pick up my, <laughs> my take on alcohol, but alcohol specifically right before bed just trashes the healthy stages of sleep. And basically that's your REM and your deep stages of sleep. So a lot of us actually drink alcohol because we think it helps us sleep and we think it helps us fall asleep. And that there may be some truth to that. Alcohol is a sedative. Alcohol may actually help you fall asleep. And by fall asleep, I mean pass out. But even if it does help you unwind, it helps you fall asleep quicker, it is trashing your sleep. It's trashing your REM and your deep stages of sleep. But remember, we were talking about these REM and deep stages of sleep being critical for a long health span. They are absolutely critical for your sleep. So wherever possible, avoid alcohol, moderate alcohol, or even consider, again, I would encourage you to just play with the idea of of removing alcohol, especially before bed. Okay, so that's it. That's my top sleep tips. If you sleep better, I promise you 
everything is better. If you're not currently getting eight hours of quality sleep every night, take some time, take the next 90 days to really work on your sleep and try and be a better sleeper. I think you'll find that everything is better when you sleep better. Okay, that's our show for today, folks. I want to remind you that you can download our free Over 50 Guide to Optimizing Your Metabolism over at silveredgefree.com. And you can find all of the show notes to this episode, including the links to the podcast I referenced, over at silveredgefitness.com slash 195. As we wrap up our time together today, you can show your support for this show in two important ways. One is to tell a friend about this podcast and encourage them to give it a listen. The second is for you YouTube folks to click the like and subscribe buttons and for you podcast folks to consider giving this podcast a five-star review on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on and be sure to subscribe and follow so you don't miss any future episodes. I really appreciate you spending your time with me today and until next time, stay strong. Stay strong.